This is Senate Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, January 26th, 2021. Um, we're meeting remotely once again. And uh, <clears throat> today's subject is <clears throat> the replacement of Woodside. Since Woodside no longer exists, we probably need to new find a new term for this. But I'm hopefully we'll have a discussion today about juvenile justice and how we're responding to it. And I've become increasingly concerned. I think Commissioner Brown is prepared to talk a little bit about it. But just as we've had problems in the adult system with folks who have significant mental illness or traumatic brain injury or are low functioning or ending up in a correction system, the same groups are ending up in our um, juvenile justice system and being asked to be dealt with by the Department of, of Children and Families rather than either mental health or jail. Um, I hope that this is the beginning of a conversation and not the end of that conversation because as we look at how to um, respond in talking with people in the field that I used to work in and that Senator Nicky used to work in. Increasingly, we're seeing numbers of people who are um, seriously, um, with serious emotional problems, being asked to be dealt with in programs that were developed for different categories. Um, there's, uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there and we'll, um, John Campbell, are you ready to say a few words or you know, yeah, I, jump, uh, jump yeah. ahead if you wouldn't mind? Sure. Um, it's going to be pretty quick because you guys have heard it all before. Uh, first of all, for the record, John Campbell, um, Executive Director of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. I, again, as I said, you all have heard this repeatedly since uh, this uh, crisis has, just, has started when they closed um, uh, Woodside. But, you know, what I'm seeing now, I, I've been talking with quite a few of our uh, prosecutors over this past week who've uh, told me about incidents that um, really scary uh, where the kids uh, who are, as you just pointed out, either have uh, some emotional mental health issues or um, cognitively are, are um, you know, disabled and uh, they're, have, they're being lodged in um, the, some police stations like up in St. Albans. St. Albans has lodged them a couple of times because there's no way to transport down to 204. Um, we've had a couple that have been in hotels. And you know, to me, um, you know, what you're doing is you're putting you know, a, a person in a hotel, but you're also putting them with a caseworker. And I don't think that that's the, the best environment, uh, the best way to, to do this. Uh, and again, part of it is also um, a transport issue. Uh, and I reached out to our sheriffs and asked them, you know, what the problems, why can't they transport? And it seems that a lot of these incidents are happening, you know, later at night. And so the, um, the part-time, uh, what we call the per diem uh, deputies, those guys, they've already worked eight, uh, some 10 hours a day, and some of them also work part-time so that they've worked, you know, another job or they have to get up at three o'clock in the morning. And then the state paid deputies, um, they are, you know, you're straight eight hours a day and um, uh, they can do it if they want, but they also, I guess they're, they're the sheriffs, you know, they're allowed to say no because they've already worked their eight hours. So you're not getting transported. Um, uh, I'll, be, I'll be really honest here. What's scary, what, what really worries me is that this other location that is being discussed, my understanding is it's probably a year off before they get all the permits and, you know, before they get all the, uh, the things done. Now, I may be wrong, and, and of course, the commissioner will know better. Um, but uh, until then, we are playing with fire. Uh, there's, there's just no way from what I have seen uh, happening in just five or six cases uh, that to me uh, were had you know, potential for really blowing up and to be where people could get hurt. Um, we need to figure something out before then. And we need to find a, you know, a facility that will be able to house, um, you know, the, the juveniles that we're discussing. And uh, it's got to be a secure facility. And, you know, one of those uh, no reject or eject type facilities. So um, there's really not much more I can say other than, you know, the warning lights are all there. 
And, uh, you know, I just don't want to have to come back and then, you know, having questions saying, well, how could have this happen when there was a, a, a tragedy? Because um, we're seeing the roadmap now as to how it is happening. John, um, do you see an increase in kids being charged who uh, may have assaulted staff members, or, uh, either staff members of DCF or staff members of group homes, that sort of thing? To be honest with you, I have to, I don't know that. I will I will check that out. Did you poll the state's attorneys in those districts where they have well, well actually well, every district has social workers, so but if you yeah. could poll the state's attorneys to see if they're seeing an increase um, in uh, assault of behavior. Um, I know that kids used to break furniture all the time um, when I worked at 204, but um, I don't remember many assaults, but I'm hearing more and more about assaults of, of staff members, either in those motels you described and even in police stations and in group homes. So I'm curious if there's been an increase in the request for charges, which would then make somebody who is um, maybe seriously uh, emotionally disturbed would then become a delinquent because right. now they've been charged with a, a, a delinquent act. Well, being arrested. Okay, let, me, let me, if I could, Senator, uh, you know, there was it, actually, there was an incident that just happened, but I'll let, um, I'll let uh, Commissioner Brown uh, fill you in on that. I think uh, he might be, um, it might be better for him to, to discuss that okay. or, um, in a hotel situation. But uh, I also peppers on, on um, I see he's here now. He may know about the case homes and whether there has been any um, uh, any increase in assaults there. But I, well, you know, I, don't, I don't plan to end the conversation today about juvenile justice. So perhaps you guys could pull the state's attorneys um, in it, if you could and um, see what we can up with. Okay. We'll um, Commissioner Brown is, thank you, John, for jumping out of turn. Appreciate it. No Commissioner problem. Brown has joined us. And if you're ready, Commissioner. There is a document, Woodside Replacement Report, that you can find on the on your screen. I mean, on your, <coughs> on the committee web page. Commissioner, I think you're still muted. I apologize. I thought I was unmuted there. Um, I, I did the same thing this morning during the <laughs> session. So, so uh, a good morning uh, for the record, Sean Brown, Commissioner for the Department for Children and Families. Um, we have provided several documents uh, for the committee this morning. We have a PowerPoint, which we can review. Um, we have a residential uh, placements uh, PowerPoint, and then also uh, we provided an overview of the program uh, just uh, that's being developed um, uh, for the Woodside replacement with Beckett. And so I know we have uh, uh, Jeff and Jay from uh, Beckett with us as well. And also today um, uh, we have Jennifer Micah, the general counsel for the Department for Children and Families. And then also Jennifer Herbert, who is the, the new uh, DCF clinical director who's been very involved in the work um, and the design and of the new facility in Newberry and working with Beckett and BGS and our Council of Juvenile Justice Administrators consultants. Um, and then also working with the Beckett treatment team and developing the program, which, you know, if there's time today, we can review with the committee. Um, uh, following up on the conversation, um, you know, that you were having at the start, uh, Senator, um, I would point out that we are seeing an increase of youth on the chin side who um, are exhibiting aggressive behaviors more than we've seen in the recent, recent past. Um, that is certainly leading to a lot of um, challenges in the way we care for youth and, and meet their needs. Um, and so I, I do wanna just share that we are, we are experiencing an, an uptick of, uh, of youth uh, on the chin side. And as, as you aptly pointed out, it does lead to concerns um, that if they act out those youth on, on their aggression, um, that it could lead to them becoming involved in the juvenile justice system, which obviously we all want to prevent. 
from happening. Um, we all want to uh, make sure they're receiving the treatment that, they're, that they need um, to move forward and certainly don't want to see them becoming involved with the juvenile justice system. So all of our work really uh, in, revolves around trying to stabilize them and move them forward and, and the providing services so that they can uh, you know, be maintained in the least restrictive setting. And for many of them, we want them to return to a community placement as soon as possible. Getting right to the Woodside replacement, we got to find a new name for this <laughs> agenda item since Woodside no longer exists. Um, yeah, it, as, as you will see in um, in the PowerPoint, and we can probably start referring to it, but uh, we have started calling the new program in Newberry that we're working to stand up uh, the Covered Bridge Treatment Center. Um, that was the name um, developed in conjunction um, with the Beckett team. Um, so we can, uh, can, moving forward, refer to it as the Covered Bridge Treatment Center. Okay. Um, Senator White have a question or a comment? <clears throat> I just had a question about, um, given the fact that it's going to take a year or two years before this is even online, and the um, <clears throat> we just had 12, I don't know how many kids we're talking about here, but we just had 12 um, secure um, level one beds that are c about to come online at the retreat. Why can't in the, um, their new beds, so why can't we use those beds instead of hotels and hospitals and police stations? Um, and also the retreat closed a couple of their units at the behest of the state. So there are units at the retreat that are also um, not filled. Just that, a question. That is correct. Um, it is a, a complicated um, uh, set of circumstances and, and the array of services that we use for our youth, Senator White. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, inpatient uh, unit that um, the retreat is closing down, it was really being underutilized given the level of care it provided. And to keep it open would have um, increased the cost exponentially for the state. And um, all involved agreed it probably made sense to wind that program down um, while maintaining services for some of our, our younger youth in our care and custody. And no, so no, 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 I didn't, I didn't mean the, the, re the youth residential program. Yeah. I meant there's mm -hmm. also another unit that they closed and I'm not talking, I'm not suggesting that it wasn't right to close those down. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is that there is space and it, there's two places where there's space at the retreat. And we just heard John Campbell say that people are being housed at hotels uh, on very unsafe situations and that it'll be two years before the covered bridge project is done. So I'm saying, can't, what, isn't what? there, that's all. Okay. Can I suggest that we need a second meeting and I hope to convene one on, the, on this issue with Monica Hunt and Sarah Squirrel and Commissioner Brown, and perhaps, you know, both Campbell and somebody from the Defender General's office, the Juvenile Defender's office, to talk about how we get through this interim, but also to learn more about what's available at the retreat um, and how kids, you know, my experience with the treat, retreat was that kids could check themselves out back in the day. Yeah. And it, and it may make sense just to jump right into the Woodside Replacement PowerPoint yeah, uh, status I would, report. Yeah. Uh, more than happy to. I, I didn't so know if Peggy, Peggy, would you keep, uh, Peggy, if you just keep that in mind to have that meeting perhaps end the next week to or the following week to continue this discussion. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if Peggy could pull up the PowerPoint yeah. and I can walk you kind of through that. Sure. Um, sure. Thank you, okay. Peggy. Do you see it? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So if we just uh, jump to the next page real quickly, just to provide background of, uh, um, uh, you know, where we've been in the last six months. Um, you know, a decision uh, was made in August um, to uh, stop admissions to the facility at the end of August. Um, and then in the uh, legislature's restatement budget, 
Um, we received um, authorization to permanently cease operations at the facility um, uh, by October 18th. Um, we permanently closed the facility on October 17th. Um, and then we were also required to submit a report on our long-term plan for justice involved youth. Um, we submitted that report at the end of October. Um, and then moving to the next slide, uh, Peggy. And then um, uh, we testified several times uh, uh, before the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight and Child Protection uh, Committees, um, who then voted uh, unanimously to approve our proposal um, uh, for justice involved youth on, on November 12th uh, with some conditions that, um, that are listed here that we work with the, uh, the local authorities in the community in Newberry um, that uh, we make sure all uh, youth in our care and custody receive treatment in the least restrictive setting, um, that only justice involved youth be placed at the facility and that it be a no eject, no reject facility. Um, and that um, in the facility in Newberry that there be a, a clinical um, uh, clinician with a PhD level overseeing the treatment program um, there. Um, and that also that we uh, negotiate the least in the investment um, to make sure that um, our investment is protected in that facility. And so we are working through, um, uh, you know, and compliant, making sure we meet all of those conditions. Um, Before we go to the next page, are there any questions on the background? Mm -hmm. Could you, uh, just for me, given our earlier conversation, justice involved youth. Would a youth who um, prior being placed in a program um, who then assaults a staff member or in a motel and assaults a staff, would that become, a, if they're charged, would that become a justice involved youth then? Even they though they weren't be, yeah, originally? If they, if, if they were not originally, they could become justice involved youth depending on the outcome of criminal charges um, follow uh, a specific assault or event, but they certainly could be and that's one of our concerns um, is, is preventing any uh, chin youth who are exhibiting aggressive behavior um, from entering uh, the justice involved system. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, and then um, the Joint Fiscal Committee in November did um, approve uh, the recommendation from the Joint uh, uh, Justice Oversight and Child Protection Committee. And we've been working um, uh, with our partners, uh, Beckett, uh, BGS, the Architect Studio Nexus, and then our consultant from the Council of Juvenile Justice Administrators. Um, we are very close to finalizing a design plan. Uh, we're hoping early next week that, that will be done, and then we will seek, you know, um, involvement with the, the community in Newberry um, and seek their approval. Um, you know, Beckett has been co in contact with the leadership in Newberry, of the Select Board, the Development Review Board, and the Zoning Board. Um, and there are plans underway as once we have a final design and program description in place that they will um, um, meet with the community and hold community forums to share uh, the information, the design and the program that will be run um, in that facility. And we are working very closely, DCF with BGS, with Beckett in negotiating uh, the terms of the lease. Um, and then also um, on, on moving forward with the renovations uh, for the facility once the design is moved forward. And um, I would point out that we do have additional funds um, earmarked in the Budget Adjustment Act um, to help pay for those renovations. Our base budget from the restatement had approximately $1.2 million set aside for the renovations. And with the work um, with the architects and Beckett um, those are looking like they'll be closer to 3.2 to 3.4. And we have 2 million in the budget adjustment request um, to pay for the um, in renovations in that facility on the front end, instead of having them um, incorporated into the lease and paid over a period of time, which then would have added interest and, um, and profit on top of that for Beckett. And so it's gonna be more cost effective for the state to make that investment in on the front end as well. Um, also, um, our clinical director, Jennifer Herbert, along with uh, Penny Sampson, who's a consultant from the Council for Juvenile Justice Administrators and um, the executive director of the Beckett's Vermont 
Permanency Initiative, Laura A. Baker, have been working very closely and regularly uh, to develop the clinical treatment program that will be delivered um, and the assessments that will be used. And that is one of the documents, the draft, the current draft of that work we've provided to the committee today. And if, if there's time and interest, we could certainly pull that up and, and have uh, uh, Beckett and our team walk you through that. Um, in terms of next steps in a time frame, um, uh, we're hoping, as I indicated, to finalize the floor plan um, complete and completing the schematic design. Um, I guess wonder if you could move us to the next page, uh, the next steps page, um, a little further down. Um, yep, right here. Um, and then in February, um, the site plan, uh, complete the site plan with a civil engineer, um, to generate the uh, construction design documents and specifications in February into March, uh, submit uh, for zoning permits during that same time frame, and, uh, and then any building permits we need from the state, and then go out to bid um, in late April, and then in May start construction. Our hope is, is time frame is that we would be um, open by this time next year in operating the program. So that would be <clears throat> winter of 2022. Yes. We're In the meantime, hoping by the end of December of, of, of this year that we will be operational. We had hoped um, to be operational in the fall, but it's looking like based on the current time frame that um, that will, we're looking towards the end of December. So a little around a year from now is, is our is our goal. So one of the and that would be six beds, correct? Six beds, yes, for secure residential services for justice-involved youth. And only justice-involved youth. Correct. Including a DOC youth as well. Good. Thank you. Um, um, in terms of, yep. Okay. No, you, I, I missed, I, I broke into your, I had another question. But go ahead. Sure, go ahead, Senator. I guess my question is, in the interim, between now and next, gen, um, next January, uh, let's say it's January, mm -hmm. um, what, is the, um, what is the plan for justice-involved youth? How are they being dealt with? We heard uh, John Campbell talk about um, kids in motels. Um, talked about um, needing transport to 204, and we have 204 here. Um, that sort sure. of thing. Um, sure. I'm sure for females, um, the Beckett School in Bennington, the Vermont, is it the Vermont School for Girls, I should know, it's in my neighborhood. I keep referring to it as the Bennington School, but it's not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they keep changing the name of it. But, um, I actually have three buildings in my neighborhood, believe me. Sure. So we, we have uh, developed a, a wide variety of um, uh, 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 programming for, for youth, justice-involved youth. Um, for those requiring the highest level of need, we have, uh, have a contract with the Sununu um, facility in New Hampshire. Um, we have utilized that once um, at the end of last summer into September uh, for one youth. Um, since uh, mid-September, we have not had any youth placed in the Sununu Center. Um, we also have been utilizing um, the Turtle Rock crisis beds um, that we've developed with Washington County Mental Health. Um, uh, between uh, July 1st and now, um, we have placed 11 youth in those um, crisis beds. Um, of those three were justice-involved youth, the other eight were, were Chins youth. Um, also, we worked with the, uh, the SEAL uh, Depot program down in your area, Senator, to uh, create three crisis beds, um, and then also a fourth bed um, for uh, youth that come in um, during the weekend or evening hours. Um, we certainly have had a history at DCF of um, once, uh, when a youth has come in to keep them um, sometimes in a police station, it made more sense there. Um, and so we've stopped that practice um, in, uh, under only very limited circumstances. And so that bed would be utilized for youth that come in 
at the last minute and juvenile justice involved and that we would utilize that one crisis bed we've developed with the SEAL program down in Bennington. Um, also, we have three other beds that we've contracted with them in addition to their regular uh, 14 bed program as well. We um, provided them a rate increase to help them meet the needs. Certainly, um, we've been seeing, um, uh, it's more on the chin side as, as we started to talk about. Um, we're seeing uh, youth on the chin side with some really challenging um, behaviors as a result of in, um, their need for services. And so we certainly want to um, provide services in the least restrictive environment and get them back to their community placements as soon as possible. Um, but some of them end up in the uh, crisis beds uh, at Turtle Rock, but also we've been utilizing those three crisis beds as well um, in, uh, in the depot program down in Bennington. Um, you know, we're certainly seeing challenges overall from the pandemic on staffing. Um, they've had a few outbreaks um, amongst their staff down there, which has certainly been a challenge and we're seeing in that other areas as well. Um, so the pandemic itself is putting stress on the system just in terms of staffing and whatnot. Um, in terms of justice involved youth, as you will see from another uh, PowerPoint that we'll put up, that's really a small sliver of the number of youth that we're serving right now through, through our residential programs. Most of them are on the chin side. And so that's why we've had very little utilization um, of, of the Sununu program. We've certainly uh, recently came close to looking to place one youth in Sununu, but we were able to de-escalate that situation and maintain them um, in state. Um, there has been some discussion um, regarding a recent incident with a youth in a motel. That was not a justice involved youth. I, I just wanna be clear about that. That was a youth we were stepping down um, um, from another program who'd been stable for, for, for some time. I've um, been looking to move them into a, a high-end foster placement. Um, and while we were waiting for that to ha um, um, be available, we needed to place that youth in a motel with um, FSD support, staff support. And unfortunately that youth did um, um, assault one of our, our staff members and it was a very traumatic experience for that staff person, but it was not a justice involved youth um, at the time but, that occurred. I guess that leads to several questions, but I, in full disclosure, I did get a call from um, someone through the VSEA last mm -hmm. night after I spoke with you on the phone, mm -hmm. um, who was concerned about the safety of the staff and whether or not putting, um, and I don't know who the, I mean, I, I don't want to know the names of the staff, obviously, but mm -hmm. were they caseworkers? Were they former Woodside staff, you know, what, what level of experience do they have in um, <clears throat> caring for somebody in that situation? These were our, our um, frontline social workers who uh, work our CHINS caseload, which this uh, youth was. I will indicate um, that we have um, made it clear that we will no longer allow the placement of youth in motels. Um, and that I have asked um, our family services leadership team to quickly develop some community alternatives that we can quickly stand up and staff um, um, with not using motels and not using our staff on nights and weekends to care for youth in that way. Uh, we certainly understand um, the difficulty of, of using our staff after hours in this way. And certainly it's a practice that has occurred um, for a long period of time, even when other programs were open, um, just based on the circumstances. But moving forward, we'll not be um, using motels for the placement of youth, nor do we want them staying in police stations, um, you know, you know, overnight pending a, a court appearance or a placement the next day. If you could prepare a report on problems with transports for me, I'm gonna be working on that as part of my work in the Senate Appropriations Committee. I'm really concerned about transports statewide, not just DCF kids. Yes, sir, certainly. We're, we're happy to provide you some information regarding so, that. So, any, I, I would like that for when we get to that uh, issue of budget area. Mm -hmm. Is it, I, just, I can't, I keep calling him Senator Campbell because he was a senator for so long. John mentioned problems with getting transport deputies. 
and that was a reason to leave kids in a in a police station rather than bring them to Bennington or wherever the program might be. Is that continued problem for you? Um, you know, um, we did experience um, some issues regarding transport uh, several months ago. We worked um, with the sheriff's um, department, particularly Sheriff Marku, um, to set up a, an after-hour system um, to make sure that we can have access to transport when, when needed for our youth. Um, and I think we're going to have some further follow-up conversations with, with Sheriff Marku and our security consultant to make sure that those um, transports are available 24-7. Um, as, as I said, I I'm really uh, mm -hmm. would like to work with you as well as uh, the state's attorneys and sheriff's department on this issue of transports. I've heard good things about Sheriff Marku and Sheriff to the Anderson and Wyndham County, Senator White, um, both stepping up on transports, but others kind of stepping down. So. Yeah, I would say one of the things we're seeing, and this is just from the broader DCF and Agency of Human Services perspective, um, you know, we've been relying on the sheriff's departments across the state and contracting to provide a, a level of security given the large number of households we're housing in motels. And, um, and we've seen some issues. And so we're putting tremendous pressure um, on the staffing levels in response to the sheriff, to the pandemic. And I think, um, you know, we're seeing the impacts of the pandemic in many areas of our systems of care. And I think we're seeing that in the transport realm as well. Final question from me, and then maybe others do. Do you have a backup plan if the community says absolutely not to the covered bridge treatment center? Um, you know, we are working through contingency plans. We have, we were having conversations um, with other providers um, at the time. And so those conversations have been left on hold, but there has certainly been interest from other providers to work with us. Um, but we felt like Beckett was the best program and the best facility, uh, but there have been other conversations so that we would be able to move in a different direction if there are issues um, uh, with the with the placement of this treatment program in that community. Other questions for Commissioner Brown from the committee? Then do you have any of your other staff who would like to make comments, Commissioner? Um, I, I would, before we move on, just uh, pull up the, the, the placement sheet just to, uh, for the committee's information to understand the wide variety of programs we use for for the placement of youth, whether they are chins or um, juvenile justice involved. I think it would be helpful to provide some perspective on the number of youth that we're serving and, and the different programs we utilize to meet their needs um, in state and out of state. So Peggy- Can you pull that up, Peggy or Sean? Thank you. Yep. So we currently have, so the, the top part of this sheet are uh, programs that we utilize in state um, and the number of youth and, uh, and the, the focus for the treatment of, of that program where we place youth. Um, and that's in the light blue above. Um, if you look down below, you will see our out-of-state placement for youth. And again, a quick summary of, of the type of program that that uh, center provides. Um, as you'll see, overall, we have 148 youth placed in uh, residential placements um, in-state and out-of-state. Of those, 117 are CHINS cases and 31 are delinquent or justice-involved youth. Um, the bulk, you know, a little more than half of those um, are, are in state and then less than half are out of state. And as you can see, the programs um, we contract with out of state are really provide a, a higher level of service for some of our youth with unique needs that we just don't have the, uh, the ability to provide that level given the small number of youth that that needing that level of care in state. And Commissioner, is that the correct date? May 20th, 2020? 
Um, that I think that date did not get updated when they when they. This is a sheet we maintain, so I apologize. So, okay, you know what? This this I, this is fairly current then. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. I just want yes. to I apologize. I missed that when we were uh, sending it to the committee. So. Oh, okay. Good. This is a sheet that we that I we use regularly to kind of track our youth and the different. Oh, okay. Good. And it gets, and so I think we just missed updating that date. Okay, so I, I, th that means that out of the 15 delinquents, seven, five were in Seahawk, two were in Windsor, one in Turtle Rock, mm -hmm. one in Laraway Footbrook, and one in Allenbrook. Would you have enough to fill six beds at Public Bridge Treatment? Yeah, I mean, that the covered bridge treatment program is really designed not to be a long term, but a short term. And so there would be youth, uh, you know, coming in and being stabilized. So we would certainly be utilizing between three and six at any time as youth uh, experience crisis or whatnot. So we believe six beds is the right size. Um, you know, before we um, closed Woodside last summer, um, you know, we had five youth or, at Woodside. And so I think, you know, and that was a high number for the last year or so, but we think it's important to make sure we have capacity because youth come into crisis for a variety of reasons at any time and we need to be prepared to meet their needs. And so, um, you know, and our goal is not to keep youth there long term, but to stabilize them, um, get them into a treatment program and then move them to a less restrictive setting when as quickly as possible when it's appropriate so that they can continue their progress in, in the least restrictive setting, whether that's a lower level residential program in state or whether it might be a um, higher level therapeutic foster home type situation if they're not <coughs> able to return home to their biological household. Thank you. Other questions for the commissioner? Mm -hmm. This has been helpful to me anyway. Yeah. Getting a picture of where we're at. Uh, why don't we, the next person on the agenda is um, Jim Henry from CL Inc., or as I refer to it, 204 Depot Street in Bennington. Good morning, everybody. So I'm James Henry, um, CL Incorporated, which is a 204, 206 Depot Street programs, as well as GAP and Horizon programs. Um, I would agree with uh, the earlier conversation in regards to the chins um, being a little more on the aggressive side, um, which definitely makes it a little more difficult um, to work with those um, youth, especially with um, where to go, you know, if they're not fitting in with us and what we can, you know, what we can do with them, especially if they're not charged based on some of their behaviors. Um, but we're basically two months in to the the 206 delinquent program, the 206 house. Um, we currently have three. Um, and I think so far, knock on wood, things are going okay. Um, not that we haven't had our moments, but uh, um, I think we're, we're doing okay. Um, definitely run into some staffing issues. Um, we had hired 46 staff last year and we lost 50. So we definitely struggle in the staffing departments. Um, we're actually working on uh, putting together a report to see where we're losing all these people to. You know, are they um, being terminated? Are they, you know, resigning? Um, but um, overall, definitely struggle in the in the staff aspect of it, um, which can lead to you know some burnout, especially when we do have some of the difficult kids um, between the 204 and the 206 house. So, and just for, I guess, a little background, 204 is generally the house for most of the, uh, the chins with the, the de delinquent labeled youth would be at 206. Um, Jim, can we, can, yeah, I, I, I'm struck by the staff. Yeah. Problem. Um, um, I, yeah. I would be personally. Obviously, I, I'm interested personally, but I'm curious if, if salary is a problem in terms of keeping them. I know you've, just out of the grapevine, I know you've lost a few staff to DCF. Um, so 
uh, is salary a problem? That's one question. And is the aggressive nature of many of these youth becoming a, a problem, um, increased need to restrain, et cetera? I mean, is that a reason for the people leaving? I'm sure there's always, you know, anytime you have turnover, there's, there's something's going on, but. Um, well, to touch on the salary um, aspect, we had a um, pretty significant um, salary increase. I want to say it was two years ago um, where we basically start at $15 an hour for somebody coming in without any experience. Um, and we all seem to think our little team here seem to think that it's not necessarily the money, you know, in a sense. Um, I think the hours are difficult, you know, where you have to require some of the weekend hours, second shift hours as such. Um, benefits may have been a little tr tricky on um, in some aspect, you know, um, having a limited, well, having our budgeted amount of full-time staff. Um, so, so, you know, rely on the part-timers that don't get the benefits. <clears throat> Um, and I believe it was about a year or so ago, up until that point, we were able to pay 100% of the insurance for an individual. And based on the increased number, um, I believe we have 79 staff now, um, probably 70 of that would be designated DCF, um, you know, in the programs and not administration. Um, so our numbers have definitely increased. So we were not able to afford to, you know, keep paying the insurance on the, on the staff. Um, so I guess in some cases it might've looked like that um, employees may even have lost a little money, even with a $15 start, you know, per, per hour, um, but then have to pay their own insurance. Um, but we, I, or we are trying to put together a little uh, report and by all means we can send it out to you once we get it, you know, finalized to look at where are we losing staff. Um, well, I, I do, I certainly, I think salary wise, I would not, I, I think that we need to do better given the kids that you're being asked to deal with. Yeah, we basically have like a 15 to $19 pay scale, depending on the experience and, you know, education that, and, and uh, you know, kind of fit people in, into that aspect. Um, the aggressive, let's see, the second question towards the, uh, the aggressive side, um, we've had some assaults, um, residents assaulting staff, um, and that's not included where it might be a restraint. Um, this would be a physical assault where a resident had attacked um, a staff member. One of them was our program manager, um, and we do struggle with sometimes getting them charged. Um, which would then allow us to get them removed, you know, in a sense, because then they would have the delinquency aspect to it. Um, but basically, you know, unless it's a real difficult situation, um, we hang on to these guys uh, and, and, you know, guys and gals. Um, we've had two recent issues with some very difficult staff um, where we were able to remove uh, remove them. Um, I believe one went to Turtle Rock. You mean, you mean difficult kids? You said staff. Yeah. Significant. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Two significant residents um, that we removed. A um, couple thousand dollars worth of property damage, um, and he uh, basically was a 15 year old um, struggling with uh, a father who is stage four cancer and dying. Um, the mother is not in the picture, um, so he really doesn't care what happens to him, and his behavior dictates that. So we struggle with, um, you know, the behaviors that he's done, you know, the possible restraints with that individual. Um, but we were able to remove him. And I believe he was the one that went to Turtle Rock. Um, the other youth, um, we were able to keep working with him um, through some of the difficulties of his aggressive behaviors, um, mostly property damage. Um, and I believe he ended up uh, going to uh, maybe Tennessee. Uh, last Monday or so. Um, but that's basically where we would struggle with, you know, if we had the, you know, the Woodside in place where we would be able to remove some of these use based on these difficult behaviors. Questions for Jim? Thank you. No question. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. We look forward to hearing a little bit more about staff and why they've left. That's a huge challenge. All right, thanks for the invite. Thank you.
Um, uh, Jay Walter uh, is the executive director or chief administrative officer of the Beckett School. Jay, thanks for joining us. Um, you're, you're still muted, sir. Thank you for joining us, Jay, and I, I appreciate it. We were hoping to get an update both on, you know, you also have the Beckett School as well as, uh, which has, I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it was a sizable yeah, number of Vermont kids in New Hampshire, which is close to Vermont, um, as well as the Bennington School for Girls, or the girl, Vermont School for Girls. Um, so any, you know, you're in both places here. You're starting a new program and then you've got Vermont kids in two of your other programs. Sure. I mean, uh, just, just, you know, briefly, you know, I, I think I would certainly echo a lot of uh, Jim's comments relative to the youth. Um, I also have Jeff Karen and Larray Coburn available. Larray oversees the program. Um, in Vermont under Jeff's tutelage, um, the Vermont School for Girls, as well as our New England School for Girls program, um, which serves primarily out-of-state children. Um, Jeff broadly oversees our children's services um, as the president of Mount Prospect Academy, which I know the, the lingo gets confusing, but uh, Mount Prospect Academy really is the, the company that oversees most of our children's residential services. Uh, Jeff is the president of that company and he can speak much better than I, sort of an administrative person relative to any questions you have uh, along the lines of uh, uh, Jim's testimony. Um, um, I, I certainly, in terms of the project, I'm not sure you know, how much to add beyond what Sean has already very capably articulated. Um, I, I know one of the concerns is to make sure that we, we vet this locally. Um, I am in regular contact with Alma from the select board. Um, we, we went through and analyzed how procedurally to proceed um, um, and are in agreement that we wish to vet this through a process at the select board level, not the DRB, which is the developmental review board level. Um, that process will be kept more focused on the exact the site plan and the physical plan and be more traditional zoning kind of dialogue. Um, I think that that process is likely to commence in the next uh, couple of weeks at the select board level. Uh, Amma and I have had dialogue by email this week. Uh, we're trying to sort out the best way to present right now with COVID um, and, and whether we're going to do a webinar, which is kind of a foreign concept to me. And so we're going to need a little bit of support from our IT team to kind of put that kind of thing together so that the community can, you know, in, interface in a way that's better than Zoom. So there's some technological issues we're dealing with due to the pandemic. Um, I, I would comment on Jim, Jim's stuff just from a business standpoint, uh, kind of a cost standpoint, um, that we, we certainly, in terms of the, this program design, have um, sought to address some of those issues. Um, the, but the industry in general, I, I think is starting to face some issues beyond just the classic pay benefit issues um, due to the pandemic that I think people should begin to be aware of. Um, the big unemployment um, support that we've provided the population this country appropriately so does have a trickle down effect um, Vermont unemployment insurance rates are extraordinarily high. We actually self-insure through a, a nonprofit um, mechanism that has significantly reduced our costs versus if we were just in the pool. But due to the unemployment, um, significant unemployment claims, a lot of those opportunities are being lost or resulting in significantly higher rates. Um, so all the success we had in running to that program um, is, you know, you know, for us, thousands and thousands of dollars is being lost. Um, the impact on insurance and um, workers' comp rates to these aggression issues are also things that, um, you know, were being pushed significantly by the insurance companies these days relative to risk 
Um, there's only a, one or two carriers for social services agencies in the country right now who are willing to take on the kind of liabilities. Um, being, you know, Hanover and Philadelphia are the two primaries. Um, and we're getting a lot of feedback that they are very nervous about litigation and liabilities associated with staff being hurt, as well as um, claims by children of abuse and neglect. Um, um, and, you know, really the evolving expectations of trying to balance when to, to, to uh, hold a child, when to, re, when to isolate a child and maintain community safety and individual safety and how that's being interpreted. So, you know, there's some trends in the industry that, you know, I guess, you know, you're asking questions about the business and I thought yeah. we're, we're apropos to the discussion um, that um, it's, a, it's, it's a rapidly, rapidly environment, you know, evolving environment um, with more and more stakeholders engaged in the dialogue. Um, and people like Jim and Jeff and Larray face, you know, just, just a lot of challenges in terms of getting everybody across the spectrum from the legislatures on down to the advocacy groups, um, to the parents, to the communities, all on the same page. Um, it, it's it's quite it, it's it's quite interesting to see this yeah, unfold, yeah. and and it's all yes. going to play out, and it's all going to play out in this particular project, perhaps um, more so than even we're experiencing. So, yeah. I um, full disclosure, since you don't know me, I before uh, I um, up until two thousand six, I was the executive director of CLA. And I ran the program from 1971 to 2006. Um, the industry, using that term, has changed dramatically in those 14 years, um, I must say. Um, and hearing, you know, and I know Jim fairly well, and, and hearing some of the issue, the issues they're facing. But you describe another one, which is get even getting insurance to um, cover the the liabilities also workers comp is, is increasing cost to you all as well as uh, other issues maybe uh, Jeff can speak a little bit to I know you've had a, assaultive um, uh, kids as well in, in programs I know in Bennington anyway we as I said three of your buildings are in my neighborhood I, I live on Madison Road you have uh, Two buildings on Madison Road, and you have one on College Road, which is right behind me. So, um, and I would, you know, I'll be the first to say, um, we, we, the neighbors, have not had problems from your programs. Um, once in a while, a runaway, you know, that we see the police out looking or something like that. <clears throat> I must say that in the years that your programs have been in this neighborhood, we have not seen problems. So. Uh, that speaks um, volumes for the type of facilities you both run, both in Depot as well as Bennington School for Girls and other programs. Thank you, Senator. Uh, would you like me to, what would you like me to? Um... Uh, if you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges you're facing, um, trying to. <clears throat> make yeah. it from here to sure. the opening of the covered bridge treatment facility? Well, I believe we can uh, uh, staff the uh, facility um, relatively easy. Um, I, I'm not concerned about staffing uh, the facility. Um, to discuss uh, a little bit about what Jay was referring to when we're talking about risk management for any program, uh, James program in, in Bennington, Larray's program in Bennington. Um, when you have a risk manager on the insurance level coming in and you're presenting him with how many assaulted faculty you've had uh, and that number doesn't decrease it usually stays the same. It takes them several several go-arounds to, to understand what kind of students you have. So 
uh, for risk management, it, that that's always a, a factor, but that was a factor back in your day, I'm sure as well. Uh, and uh, it takes uh, very committed human beings to work with our kids, despite uh, the abuse our, our faculty suffer on a daily basis. Um, but we just encourage them that that abuse leaves in a while for every child. They kind of go through a cycle and they get upset at you. And then uh, once they trust you and connect with you, then you make a bond. And, and so when, if you can keep a faculty member there for half a year to a year, um, they, they generally um, understand and get an intrinsic value from connecting with our kids. Uh, and for us on the New Hampshire end, in the Vermont and Vermont does a wonderful job of retaining staff. Um, and we can spend an hour on why that is. And in New Hampshire, um, I think like James, I have some programs that are more geared towards more of our intensive violent assaultive kids. Uh, that's up in the 40 percentile um, for uh, faculty leaving turnover rate. <laughs> Uh, and um, our more assessment programs geared towards kids coming in, get them stabilized and assessing them, we have zero uh, turnover rate in those programs for faculty. So um, just like anyone here would, in, would just guess, the more violent the child, the more turnover you're gonna get. Um, and um, that's because we have a wide variety of citizens that, that work with us from uh, 65 years of age, male and female, all the way down to 24, right out of college. And, and so, um, although probably you and I, Senator, we, we took a lot of punches in the day. Uh, uh, some folks just, they weren't domesticated that way. They just don't understand why they should be assaulted at work. Um, so uh, generally take somebody like Larray with a good sense of humor, you know, uh, just to expect it a little bit, uh, and James. Um, so, uh, but again, um, as, we, as we're moving forward, um, I'm, I have the privilege of having Jay worry about risk management and the insurance couriers of which we only have two. Um, so we really can't be that bad or we're going to get dropped. Um, so that puts pressure on me operationally to make sure that we run the safest programs we can. And uh, from what I'm told by uh, insurance carriers, we do a good job. And uh, so I expect to um, put forth the same, if not more stringent, risk management strategies uh, in the Covered Bridge program. Um, and again, it's a six bed program. It's, it's, it's incredibly um, intimate because it's so small, which is awesome. Uh, and, um, and, and the, the site is wonderful and uh, we appreciate and uh, respect uh, the amount of resources going into that building. Um, Jay and I certainly aren't used to that. Uh, we, we usually fix up a building as we kind of go and move kids out of bedrooms and refix the bedrooms and kind of go at it that rate. But uh, so this is a, um, a luxury to uh, have a certain amount of time with some engineers to, to respectfully uh, engineer some space that these children can uh, receive a good intake, um, have uh, a treatment team analyze what their um, major uh, issues are and then work on the major ones, decrease the aggression and get them to a lesser restrictive facility in the shortest amount of time. And, uh, and that's fun for us. So we, um, that's been our model for forever. So. Great. I wonder if there's any questions for either you or Laurie, Senator White. Oh, no, I had a question for Mr. Walter and the commissioner, so. Go ahead. Oh, so I, um, I should have thought of this before, but 
I was surprised when you talked about um, meeting with the community people, because I, in my other life, I've worked on a number of projects um, uh, like this that are to be cited in a community. And I think that I heard that you are hoping to con start construction in May. And this is February, so you have February, March, and April, and you have to go out for bids, and the community has not even been, um, ha has not even, they haven't been involved up to this point is my understanding. So how on earth are you gonna go out to start construction on May? Because going out to bid takes a couple months in itself, and and this is February. So I, I'm concerned about the um, what would happen because I have seen projects like this be completely turned down by a community. And I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about your time frame. So um, I'll, I'll jump in here and then Jay jump in as well. Um, um, you know, Beckett, this isn't uh, in terms of uh, the, the use we're anticipating for this facility in Newberry. Um, Beckett has owned this property for several years and they have run um, several different types of residential programs there as, uh, already. Um, the most recent iteration was an assessment center for some younger youth, but before that they also ran um, some other type of uh, residential programming. So for the community, th this has already been this type of program. This, the anticipated use now will be smaller than those prior uses. And Jay, please feel free to jump in here. Um, so the community has experience working with Beckett and Newberry and their running programs. And so it'll be more of educating them on, on the switch of the use and the decrease in the, in the capacity that, that's gonna be served in that program. Um, and, then, and then just given, um, you know, I think for, for us, we wanna make sure they're comfortable with the, the renovations we're proposing. It won't look much different from the outside than it does now. There'll be some structural changes to the facility, but I'll, I'll kind of let Jay weigh in on his relationship with the community over time and, and their running of programs there. So this isn't a new, a, a new concept for the community. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would comment, I mean, I, I would echo uh, Sean's comments. I think that they, you know, accurately present a lot of the facts. Um, the, the reality is, I think, <laughs> You know, one thing we as a company have done, notwithstanding being a nonprofit, you know, we, we've always paid property taxes. We've always fought with the funding agencies for funding to do so, or if we didn't get the funding, we paid them anyway, um, because we wanted to respect that issue in the community. Um, that's gone a long way in towns like Newberry, where we've already been in towards sort of putting to rest and creating some trust, um, because that issue is so big in, in, in New England, in particular in Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, um, you know, because we've had programs there and because I think we select sites that we try to minimize community impact, uh, we try to create open space. I think that I'll people pe that. Pe people in this neighborhood, and I think Dick, you've seen it down in uh, Brattleboro, I mean, Bennington, you know, we try to improve the properties. We try to make the places better than we got them. And I think there's a general understanding of that. And we really haven't had a lot of issues in that community. And we have been behind the scenes talking to people. Um, and there doesn't appear to be a great deal of um, angst in the community, although there are people asking questions. Um, my approach has been, let's get the site plan and the project plan nailed down because I know one thing in my experience with working with community people is they don't like being told one thing and then seeing another thing. Um, um, they feel like a bait and switch and we want to avoid at all costs sort of that approach. Um, the actual legal zoning issues here are actually fairly um, minor because we have a permit for this particular use already. It's really, um, we are already are cited as a 12 bed residential treatment facility, which is exactly how this program is going to be licensed. Um, um, so it's really an amendment of the, the, the license. And I've spoken to both DRB and the zoning board about how they'd like us to proceed. And I think we're pretty comfortable that that's not going to be the holdup. Now, if there's opposition that arises, you know, what, you know, I don't, 
you know, it's going to arise. And I think the legal processes in that community will advise us as to how to proceed and, and ultimately make a decision. Um, I'm very confident that this will go through, but I'm not positive. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, there will always be opposition to anything, but um, and I, I guess I missed somewhere along the line the fact that you'd already had programming there before, and so I, I was thinking of this as a new, new concept to the community. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. You, you will, you, you always have neighborhood concerns, and you try to address them as best you can. As I said, I, I'm a neighbor. Um, of your programs and um, you know our our concern is um, you know always various things but you, you live with that I, in 1971 it was a lot different opening a program in downtown Bennington than it is today and it was kind of unheard of um, so, yeah. um, any other questions for the group at Beckett before we go to Marshall Paul, the juvenile defender. I, wanna, I, I, I do want to continue this conversation. I am especially concerned about the aggressive, I guess we're using the term aggressive. I think it's much more than that. I think that we have some extremely seriously emotionally disturbed kids in the system who are being asked to be dealt with by DCF who if not treated and don't make changes are gonna be in our adult correction system before them on. And um, I, I wanna continue that discussion in the near future regarding um, the role of DMH, DC, DCF and uh, Department of Aging and Independent Living. And I, just as, DOC is the institutional last resort. I'm getting a feeling that DCF has become an institutional last resort, and maybe it's not always appropriate. So, the help from all of you at Beckett and see all, you are on the front lines, you see it, you know who you're dealing with. We really don't. Um, and so any information you can give us about the types of kids you're being asked to deal with. And I will add that Senator Nitka has long experience in the juvenile system. She, was a so, she, is, a social, she is a social worker. She's worked for um, various groups over the years. Yeah, I've been at uh, Beckett's program in New Hampshire. It's quite a long time ago, but did a nice job. Marshall? Welcome. Thank you, Senator. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm Marshall Paul. I'm the Deputy Defender General and Chief Juvenile Defender. Um, and I'll start by saying what I've said the last few times I've testified, which is that we are very happy to uh, generally support the direction that this project has been going in. Uh, you know, we're supportive of the effort to close Woodside, to move on to a facility that is sized better and designed better for the population of kids that it is serving. Um, and so, you know, with that said, we certainly have been cautious in our support. We've been reviewing the uh, proposals that DCF has put forward, their plans, their intentions going forward. And honestly, while we certainly share some of the small concerns that are outlined in the Disability Rights Vermont testimony that's on the website, um, we don't see those as major hurdles. Um, what those are are, to our mind, sort of small disagreements as to approach. So what I, my point by sort of highlighting that is to say, that we're looking at this carefully and we're cautious and we have certain aspects of this that we're waiting to see how it develops and that we have questions about, but we're actually extraordinarily pleased with the direction that this has gone so far. Um, that said, I'll touch on a few of the issues that have been 
raised today, and I think the primary one um, is the distinction between the Chins population and the juvenile justice population and how those two fit into our sort of constellation of residential placements. Um, you know, and honestly, some of this, I've got to share, you know, prior, before I even, before I was defended, uh, uh, juvenile defender, before I went to law school, um, I was a behavioral interventionist at the Howard Center, working mostly with what we would consider to be the, the chins population. Um, and, you know, even going back then, in, which was sort of uh, mid, to, mid to early 2000s, you were talking about a population of kids who were really deeply traumatized, really deeply affected, uh, and have a lot of problems in their life that they're going to have to overcome. And that led to them being, honestly, a far more difficult group of kids um, and, and honestly, a far more physically aggressive group of kids than the older, slightly more sophisticated, uh, justice-involved youth that we were seeing when I started as a lawyer visiting Woodside and working with kids at Woodside and working with other justice-involved kids in other settings. Um, it's natural when you consider sort of how people wind up in these various placements. You know, those kids that are coming through the chin system, those are especially the ones who are in that sort of early adolescent or pre-adolescent uh, age. You know, those are kids who in order for them to wind up in custody and in a residential facility, they are, you know, almost, almost all of them have really suffered tremendous trauma, have really suffered tremendous harm, have really suffered tremendous hurt, and they lash out in a way that's entirely predictable when you keep that in mind. Um, you know, I remember when I was doing my training at the Howard Center, uh, we had a, a week-long training in de-escalation and restraint and appropriate uses of restraint and appropriate uses of seclusion and, uh, you know, ways to de-escalate situations so that you never even wind up in that situation. And I asked the question, I, I asked, you know, they were describing all of the ways to block punches and restrain kids safely. And I asked the question of people who are training, you know, should I be expecting that I'm going to get punched here? Is that why you're teaching me this? And they stopped everything and said, yeah, of course, that's why we're teaching you this. Why the heck do you think we're teaching you how to block punches? if we don't expect that you are gonna be dealing with physically aggressive kids who are gonna get physically aggressive with you. And that's gonna be something that's part of your job to deal with. And that is wherever the, these kids are, um, whether they're at the retreat, whether they find themselves in, find their way into the justice system and wind up at Woodside, whether they remain in the chin system and are in specialized treatment programs, that uh, really are focused on the trauma and therapy that those kids need. Um, they're going to be aggressive. There are going to be assaults. There are going to be ag physically aggressive situations that fall somewhere short of an assault. And honestly, that's the that's the work. That's the work that um, you know the the people who are there supervising, treating and administering these programs do. And, you know, it's not like there's any silver bullet, like uh, you well, can create some program that will eliminate that aggressiveness or eliminate those problems. It's more a question of how do you deal with it? And it happens that I was on a phone call yesterday afternoon. Uh, I do a monthly phone call with sort of my counterparts in New England, chief juvenile defenders in all the other New England states. Um, and the topic came up about placement stability and uh, you know, how, how the various states were dealing with placement issues. And honestly, during the pandemic, nobody is having an easy go of it. Uh, you know, all over New England, all the other juvenile defenders were reporting the same kind of stuff that's been discussed here, that there's been staffing problems at programs due to the pandemic and due to some of the collateral issues that surround the pandemic, uh, that's led to some programs, you know, not necessarily discharging people, but refusing new admissions. That's led to programs 
uh, you know, refusing the admission of kids who were particularly higher need, but who they might have accepted in the past, but due to their staffing levels and due to the difficulties in finding staff at this moment, they would not accept those kids. So to the extent that what we're seeing is sort of some real pandemic related challenges to our ability to place kids in appropriate programs, um, you know, that's not just a problem in Vermont, that's a problem that's being experienced certainly region-wide, and I wouldn't doubt that it's a problem that's being experienced nationwide. Um, so- well, Can I just break in, Marshall? I can't hold my sure. thoughts any longer. I think what's missing from your discussion is accountability. How do we hold these kids accountable for that behavior? It's fine, yes, we expect that some kids are gonna act out aggressively, but it seems that programs are having difficulty holding those kids accountable. <clears throat> and when you have assaultive behavior, like what occurred with the, um, what Commissioner Brown just described, when you have other behaviors, if you can't hold kids accountable, what what is to prevent that from continuing? And I, I guess I'm sounding old fashioned, but um, you know, we used to have a thing called sitting in the dining room. I know it wasn't isolation because everybody had to walk through the dining room. But I started that in 1971 because I couldn't have them go out back and dig a six foot hole, six foot wide and six foot deep like we did at the Lakeside Center where we basically had sand in Burlington. But there has to be something to hold kids accountable. And I, I'm hearing from those that are working in the industry, that's one of the frustrations. I think there's two answers to that question, Senator. And that is that there's certainly those, those situations that cross the line from the sort of um, expected and you know, even therapeutically appropriate <clears throat> aggressiveness and resistance that uh, sometimes manifests itself physically, but is really part of the overall sort of progress of treatment of some of these kids versus the more escalated stuff like, um, you know, that attack that's been described uh, with the child who was in the motel uh, and assaulted a DCF staff member. There's a point where absolutely, you know, a kid might engage in behavior that is th the only appropriate way to handle it is to charge them and uh, for them to be dealt with through the justice system. But I think that what uh, the other, the flip side of that, and I don't think that this is any, you know, I think certainly Senator Sears this wouldn't be news to you, nor to anyone else who's worked in this field, is that in a lot of cases, the accountability is actually, it, it's best not to be removing kids from these programs, plunking them into you know, the, the category of justice-involved youth, because in a lot of cases, that physical aggressiveness and the response to it is actually part of therapeutic progress, that it's important to address the harm that kids cause in a residential program in the actual milieu of that program and to provide that accountability in that program. Um, you know, honestly, you gave an example of it with the time out in the, in the you know, sitting in the dining room. Um, that may be one very appropriate in certain circumstances, way to de-escalate a aggressive situation uh, remove a kid from one physical place to a different physical place, or maybe they won't be affected by the same stimulus, uh, and start to process with that kid what they actually went through, why they engaged in the behavior they engaged in, what strategies can be used to prevent that in the future. If the response is always, oh, the moment a kid becomes physical, we remove them from the program and put them in some sort of an escalated uh, or, you know, more more restrictive environment, like taking a kid from a, you know, a residential program that's really suited to their therapeutic needs and moving them into a justice-involved youth program that's really about containment and safety, 
um, you know, you're actually doing more harm than good because you are essentially stopping that kid's therapeutic progress or at least interrupting it. Um, it because it certainly, you know, and I'm sure everyone who's in the meeting who's been involved in this work can tell you, it, it's not a short process to develop a therapeutic relationship with a kid. And so if a kid gets moved from program to program to program, every time that they display any aggression, you're essentially ensuring that no program is ever going to develop a therapeutic relation with that relationship with that kid, and that that kid is never going to make the progress that they need to make. And so I think the, you know, it, it, it's not a new approach to say, we try to, you know, we try to keep these kids in these programs, deal with their behaviors within the programs as best we can, use those behaviors as actually opportunities to make therapeutic progress and to make, you know, really positive change. Um, you know, that's not a new concept. That's been certainly how, how these, these types of programs have worked since I first uh, interacted with them in the early 2000s. Um, and it continues to be how they work today. So to me, the, the short answer is that we need to keep dealing with it the way it's always been dealt with, which is draw a line. And when kids cross that line and it becomes inappropriate and unsafe for them to be anywhere besides a secure justice involved youth facility, then okay, that makes sense. And up to that line, we gotta keep trying to work with these kids in the programs they're in, as long as those programs remain appropriate um, and trying to keep making the progress that we can make with those kids so that they can step down and step back into the community uh, and not wind up sort of escalating through the juvenile justice system into the criminal justice system. And I think the most important part of that is having a system of residential care that actually provides everything that we need so that we have placements that have the specialized treatment available for all the kids that we need to place. Because that's, you know, I mean, I can tell you my experience with the kids, both kids at Woodside, justice involved youth and other programs, and kids coming out of the chin system, abused and neglected youth, um, is that we see the most aggressive behavior and the most problems in a residential program when kids are placed inappropriately. It's the kind of stuff that you see when kids have remained in a program too long and are really no longer making therapeutic progress or when they're initially first placed in a program that turns out to really not suit that kid's needs. That's where we start to see the aggression. And sometimes the aggression really comes in a way that's therapeutically appropriate. I can't count the number of times I've had clinicians talk to me as a, as a kid's lawyer and say, look, just to warn you, we expect as we start to dig into this kid's uh, trauma history, that there's going to be aggressive behavior. And you're gonna hear about that as the kid's lawyer. And you know, we want you to understand that that's expected in certain circumstances because that's the very nature of trying to address trauma that's been experienced, but never processed and never treated for years and years and years. As long as it gets treated. As long as it gets treated. As long as, um, you know, I'm an old glasser type person who believes in accepting responsibility. Anyhow, um, Marshall, thank you so much. Um, it's always interesting to have that conversation. Um, I, I am concerned about the future getting from step A to step B, which step A was closing Woodside, step B is opening something else. Uh, I'll have to get the covered bridge down properly um, in the lexicon, but um, how we get from there in the next year, or whatever it takes to open it, and how many kids, you know, are placed. And I, my understanding is that some of the problems are transportation problems and you're right that COVID certainly has exasperated a lot of these problems for these programs. Um, we have people who are working front lines, um, 
either a 204, I'm going to use, I'll keep calling it 204, I keep calling it CR, and the Bennington School for Girls. We're working on the front lines and watching other people collecting huge unemployment checks. And I don't begrudge those folks for getting those unemployment checks, but when you're paying 15 bucks to 16 bucks or 17 bucks an hour, you add that up and compare that with a $600 bonus to whatever unemployment was paid. And you're sitting there taking abuse from those kids. As difficult as that is, I have to have sympathy for those workers. And that's why I'm hoping that I, I really think you need to do much better, at least temporarily, than this 15 or 16 or so, whatever you pay it at the Bennington School for Girls. We need to do much better because these folks are, particularly those that have hung around there for the whole year of this pandemic, put in some amazing uh, work. So, I, I, Commissioner, I hope you'll um, take that at, to heart as well as uh, I. When you see that kind of turnover, if you're getting that, um, it's concerning. And it may not be just pay, but I know um, people um, look at that issue. Uh, Jay brought up the unemployment. I think that's an important factor in trying to keep people um, in your programs. I, mm -hmm. If you wanted to comment on that, Jay or Jeff or Laura, um, Jim, anybody who wants to comment on that? If I could just jump in, Senator, your point is well taken, and I can't emphasize enough um, at the partnership um, with the CL program and Beckett with the Vermont School for Girls and the program they run in New Hampshire that serves many of our youth. Um, you know, their programs and their staff really have stepped up during the pandemic, uh, been on the front lines, um, and I'm happy to look at if there's a way that we can, you know, try to recognize of that work of their staff over the last year, just as we have in some of the other programs we've administered, you know, in terms of a stabilization or incentive pay. And I'm certainly willing to have those conversations for well, sure. I, I hope you will. And uh, as mm -hmm. the uh, the next round of CARES fund comes, and we look at groups, I don't think, um, I would be really appreciated as we look at this, um, uh, <clears throat> especially trying to get from here to there Hopefully this will be over and by next January and the new um, <laughs> covered bridge. It would have been easier if it was the Silk Road Bridge or something. Um, uh, that's the one just down from, that's how they get from the two campuses. They go over the Silk Road Bridge in Bennington, at the mm -hmm. Bennington School for Girls, by the way. That's what I thought of Silk Road. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, Judge Grierson, our final witness. Yes. Thanks, uh, Commissioner, I, thank you. Please do look into that, and then we can talk about it the next time we're together on this issue in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. I'm happy to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thanks to the committee for inviting me. Uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, yeah, my comments will be brief, but I, I'm I'm certainly encouraged by the time uh, frame timetable that has been discussed for having this facility available. Um, as as this committee knows, probably better than any other committee, um, with the expansion of uh, juvenile jurisdiction over the last few years, and it will continue. Um, the importance of having uh, this facility um, can't be understated. A couple of things, uh, Senator, that uh, Sears, that you mentioned, you mentioned more than once about transportation issues. And I would, I think this is as good a time as any to, to um, for the committee and, and Commissioner Brown and Mr. Walter to consider as they're putting up this new facility, if there's one thing, and I'll, I'll call it a silver lining, um, that has come out of the pandemic, uh, everyone knows how much that has impacted the operation of the courts as well as all the other institutions, but a significant impact on the court's operations. But what we have done and continue to try to do is expand our ability to conduct remote hearings and conduct them in a way that uh, you know, Marshall and, and his 
uh, attorneys as well as the state's attorneys are able to communicate uh, with each other and communicate certainly in Marshall's case with their clients effectively. Um, with a new facility going up, um, even when this pandemic is over, we expect that uh, the ability to conduct uh, some hearings or even partial hearings remotely is going to uh, continue to be important. And when you think about uh, where Newberry is, as beautiful as that setting is over there, um, to get to other parts of the state obviously involves a significant uh, transportation issue. And uh, I can certainly remember before the pandemic hit um, and, and talking about the, the youth that are served by this facility, this type of facility, as well as Woodside, there were times when we would transport uh, somebody from Woodside um, to another part of the state. Um, and, and let's face it, there's an element of trauma involved in, in those transports. Uh, usually they were uh, put into uh, restraints for that uh, transport. Sometimes uh, I can think of at least one courthouse where in order to access the courtroom, they had to come up through a, a public elevator in restraints. Um, and what I think is important to remember is if we can find a way within this new facility to accommodate uh, video capability, um, I think it's important in, in that structure to at least have that as an option. Uh, sometimes those hearings, uh, you, they would be transporting somebody from Woodside for two hours for a 15 minute hearing. And I think with everything we've learned in this uh, process during the pandemic of remote hearings, there will be a place for it. And I would just ask uh, the commissioner as well as Mr. Walter to consider that in their, uh, in, in their plans uh, for, this, for this new facility. That's a great comment, um, Judge. One day I was um, touring 204 with uh, Jim and uh, <clears throat> um, then Commissioner Schatz, and I noticed that kids were actually visiting with their parents remotely because, because of COVID, the parents couldn't come down to Bennington from Brattleboro, I mean, from uh, Newport, but then I thought back to my own experience, it was very rare that parents drove down to Bennington right. to, Newport to visit a kid. And <clears throat> how much easier it is if we are able to provide that remote um, access. And I certainly think the ability and the quality of, of the uh, technology that is out there now, um, I th as important as it is for court proceedings, what you've just mentioned, Senator Sears, is even more important because of the uh, the geographic uh, issues relating to living in Vermont. Um, sometimes it's just impossible weather-wise uh, or economic-wise for families to, to uh, have that contact. So um, I'm, I'm glad to answer any questions, but I know the time is short and I just wanted to take the opportunity to uh, okay. make sure that that issue was considered. Have you seen an increase in Chin's kids being charged as adults, um, you know, I, as a result I, of assaultive behavior, and I, I can't say that I have, Senator, but that's because we're still pulling together our year-end data, and I, I don't have that at hand. So as soon as that information data is available, I'll obviously make it available to the committees. I missed uh, John Campbell's uh, uh, earlier testimony, so um, I can't well, I, say that I have, yeah. but. There was a recent incident, and I think that has people's minds um, attuned to the aggressive behavior, but I, I do know there's been a number of those cases. Well, it's clear from what we're seeing, again, going back to the remote hearings, um, it, it isn't just the youth that are impacted by uh, the stress related to COVID and, and the pandemic. Uh, we're seeing it in, in hearings, um, a general lack of civility um, uh, is more pronounced when you, when you can see it on the, on the screen. And uh, so if we're seeing that in adults, it certainly doesn't surprise me that we're seeing it uh, in youth that are under significant other pressures. Let me ask one more question. I thought one of the most important things Marshall said to us, he probably didn't think I was listening, but I was, and I, we need the appropriate program for the for that kid. Um, 
and trying to put the kid in an inappropriate program is counterproductive and can, can harm the kid and, 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 and others within that program too, by the way. I thought that was a key comment. Do you feel right now, or do judges feel in general that they have appropriate placements? You know, Senator, we obviously in that context have to rely on the information that comes to us from, from DCF. So we can only look to the resources that are available. And I know that one of the most difficult decisions for any judge to make um, is when the only, seemingly the only uh, available treatment or program is out of state because we know what that means, not only uh, to, that, to the child, but to the child's family, which is their primary source of support. So uh, that's why we're, we're looking forward to having this program within, within Vermont. That, that's where I think you would see the, the judge's frustration is that it's, it's those most, I'll say it, the, the most difficult children um, that we're working with, that the fewer options we have um, is, is what we're sensing. And that decision to send someone out of state is extremely difficult. Senator White has a comment or question. Well, I was just going to say that we need to remember that um, the states in New England are pretty small. And if we're talking about out of state, um, Keene or Lebanon or Concord, that's much closer to Brattleboro and Bennington than Newport, Newberry, so whichever town, I can't remember which one it was, but so I, I think that if you're talking about out of state in Tennessee, that's very different, but if you're talking out of state in New Hampshire or upstate New York, that, or even Northern Massachusetts, that's um, it's all relative. Yeah, I, no, I understand, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's sometimes when we are sending them, uh, way beyond the New England states. Yeah. Uh, th th that's where it's, and that's where some of the programming is, the only available programming. Yeah. Uh, but it still makes it a difficult decision, even if it's New Hampshire or New York. We've reached that hour of noontime where we need to adjourn, but I wanna thank everybody um, for being here today and for the excellent presentations. And hopefully we can continue this conversation in the near future. Um, and hopefully, Peggy, we can add disability rights to the conversation. And, um, they, there is a document on our webpage uh, from disability rights with suggestions for the uh, building itself at Cover Bridge Treatment Facility. Senator Sears, yeah. before, before we go, can I just make a comment? I thought that um, Judge Grierson was right on when he talked about uh, making sure that there was ca video capability in there. Yeah. And I would um, challenge um, Senator Benning as chair of Senate institutions to make sure that <coughs> any time now that there's a new building that's going to be constructed or rehabbed that, they, that there be video conferencing capabilities. Senator Benning has been listening. Uh, a lot of the witnesses on this screen should know they're going to be invited to an institutions committee meeting in the not too distant future. Good. Uh, I could just add that uh, Senator. We that need. And so we've had several conversations with Beckett to make sure that we have right. um, most up to date technology and space for kids for uh, video teleconferencing. And if, so. if Senator Benning, are you planning to take testimony on the <clears throat> concerns expressed by? Vermont disability rights regarding the facility. I have not seen that document yet, um, but I'll take. If you let us, let, if you take a look at it, let us know. We we usually don't get involved in buildings here. So. Right. Okay. Uh, again, thank you all very much. We've got some follow up stuff, and Peggy will be in touch when we hold our next hearing on this issue of the.